cells in for azimuth, and you had a course to find cells in for elevation. And you have similar devices on the mount themselves. So when the system's working, as soon as you move, you create what's called an error voltage because you're not sighting exactly the same direction as the mount. It takes this error voltage, it amplifies it first through vacuum tubes, then it wow. goes to what's called an amplodyne, which is a rotary generator amplifier. It's not efficient, it takes a lot of current to do it, but in the 1940s that's all they had. Today you do it with solid state. If you try to do it then with vacuum tubes, you would end up with humongous vacuum tubes. So this rotary converter thing, or rather a rotary amplifier, works well. Now, after it comes out of that amplifier, it feeds to that horse motor. Here's the one for uh, the azimuth. There's one on the other side for elevation. So you have the two axes of motion. As soon as the gun moves to the alignment position, obviously, it stops energizing the motor and it, and it, and it rests there. Now, I talked about the uh, computer. There is a computer that sits in this information line between these cells and those cells. That has quite a few inputs to it. The navigator inputs into this computer the altitude, the airspeed and the and the uh, outside temperature, which can affect the trajectory of the bullet. Inherent in the programming of the amplifier is the trajectory path of a 50 caliber slug. If you are shooting at something that's moving perpendicular to your plane, you have two things here. You have two gyros. The gyros input into the computer the angular velocity, so you don't have to put a lead on that. Wow. And then I'll show you the sighting picture. So they didn't have to lead themselves? No, the computer put the lead on Wow. It. Now, what the gunner <laughs> had to do, two serious things. One is carefully track the plane. The other is input the range. Well, the way the range was done, and you'll see it when I turn it on, there's a series of dots, a bunch of dots in a circle. And there's also a number scale up here. If he's shooting at a Japanese Zero and it's coming head on to him, the Japanese Zero had a 40 foot wingspan. He cranks 40 and by turning this knob, mm, that makes and by moving this knob, it changes the diameter of that circle. He keeps it touching the wingspan. That inputs the range. It's triangulation, yeah. Without the range being right, you can imagine all the other things would not work. Oh, another, another input into the computer is parallax. If he's shooting that gun from back here, obviously you've got an angular difference. The computer takes care of that. If he gets his range right, it adjusts for the parallax. 1940. I, I'm impressed. <laughs> I didn't realize they had computers on until I come down and started working here. I was impressed. It's heavy, it's big, it's mechanical, it works. But it doesn't crash either. On the day, <laughs> well, on the day that it doesn't work, and sometimes it didn't, it throws this little switch. It takes the computer input out of the system, and he moves his little peep sight down like this. Okay, now he's a B-17 gun. He has to do everything. He looks through the little peep sight and does his own lead, his own elevation, all of that. But if you're using tracers, he can make his corrections and do it. So you have backup so you don't lose the effect. Did he have machine. to load tracers at that point, or are they already in no, there? they're in there, if, if you chose to use them. And they usually use them. Um, they also have gun cameras that they could put in all of the uh, turrets. And uh, uh, it works better if you're going to try to keep track of the guy's shooting ability to have tracers in, because the gun camera will record the 